Tonight we are learning Le'ilu Nishma to Efal Fa'ud ben Rina Rita and we are also learning Le'ilu Nishma to Yechezkel ben Tzila. Okay, so now uh, two weeks ago we spoke about um, the four exiles and today we are sort of um, continuing that concept so we're going to do a very very brief uh, recap on that. So we ended off last two weeks ago, with the Brit Ben Abtarim. This is the covenant between the parts. This is with, uh, between God and Abraham. What happened was is that God told to Abraham he's going to take three goats, three rams, and a turtle dove, and a young bird. And what Abraham did is that he split each of the animals except for the animal for the birds. Now, what we spoke about last time is that each, and this is based off the Maharal, that each of the animals represent a different exile. Now, why is it that Avraham cut three of the exiles, which represents three of the exiles, and not the fourth, which is the birds? And we spoke about that each one represents a different one. So, for example, the Babylonian exile. The Babylonian exile, we said that is associated with power, with strength. And uh, what the, the concept of, of Babel is, is the strongest will survive. So if I have the power to destroy you, I will destroy you. And that's what they did. They took our, you know, they destroyed a lot of the Jewish people. They also destroyed the Beit HaMikdash. And uh, they went in a power-hungry phrase to go and destroy the entire Jewish uh, nation. Now what, Babel, what Babylon says, and says, listen, says you have power, you got to use it. What, but the Jews, the Jewish mindset could argue in that. What's the, uh, what's the argument of that? Like, yes, you're right. You could use your power to destroy others. However, there's a different concept of power. What is the, the, the Mishnah in Pekeh Avot says in the fourth paragraph? It says, Who is somebody who is strong? Somebody who could overcome his desire, his temptation, his, his inclination. So what happens is, is that you have over here Babylonian ideology. And then you have... Well, wait a minute. We have the Jewish ideology. What's the Jewish ideology? The Jewish ideology is that we will be able to go and overcome, use power for a different, in a different aspect. So why is it that, uh, that Avraham cut specifically these animals and not the other ones? Because there are certain animals that the ideology can go both ways. It could either go in an aspect of a the, the called the evil way or the, the negative way or it could go in the positive way which is the Jewish way. So that's the Babylonian one. Then you have the Persian one. The Persian one was we spoke about was, was about lust, temptation, immorality. They, they, they chased the beauty. So what was the concept of the beauty? The Persians would go and say, not talking about the Jewish persons, if there's any Jewish persons over here, we're not referring to, uh, you know, to that. So the, the concept of, of the Persian beauty, what they went after, was if there's beauty, then God, then there's a reason for it, and our life's goal should be chasing after this. And what the Jewish argument against that would be like, yeah, there is beauty, there is pleasures that you can have in the world, but there is a kosher way for pleasures. And in fact, this is something that is very, very important in Judaism, that you have the majority of things that you're able to do, a lot of people say Judaism very restrictive. Can do a lot. You have to. You have so many restrictions that you that you can't do. And I, I spoke to people. I was actually speaking to people yesterday where they were like, you know, it's too hard. It's too difficult. Now, when you think about it, yes, Judaism is restrictive. But the majority of things that you can, that you want to do in your life, you could do as a Jew. It just has to be in a kosher manner. Now, what is the aspect of here? Something very, very important. That when you let's say let's say food, people like to eat, and uh, so when you take a piece of food and you just eat it, so you're just utilizing it for yourself. Now, of course there's kosher food and it's not kosher food. But when you're going and let's say you make a bracha on kosher food, you make a blessing over the kosher food, then all of a sudden you're taking something that is mundane, taking something that's physical and you're raising it to a spiritual realm. That goes across the board to so many aspects in your physical pleasures, because again, eating is, is a pleasure. So there's so many physical pleasures that you could have that you're taking it instead of having it from a, 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 a lustful animalistic desire, you're taking something, you're enjoying it, you're gaining pleasure from it, but you're raising it to another level. So what the, the Persian says, oh, you see all these pleasures? We have to go and chase after the pleasures of the world. And Jewish people says, no, you're allowed to have the pleasures. But if you have it a kosher way, then you go, not only do you enjoy it in this world, you also enjoy it in the next world as well. That is the concept of arguing with Persia, and that's why they also, they cut the animals, Abraham cut the animals that are associated with the Persian exile. Then we had the Greece, the Greece, the Greece, the Greece, the, the, the intellect. What, the Greece was, was, uh, was Hellenism, it was all about focus on intellectualism and, and uh, different ideologies. And uh, their concept was is that we have to use our wisdom. We have to use our intellectual abilities to what? To serve ourselves. And the Jewish people said, no, no, no. We do have to use our intellectual wisdom, but what do we use it for? We use it for other people. That is the difference the concept between using the oil. The oil can either be used to consume, which only helps yourself, or to light and to go and to help others. So the Greece was all about like just, just focus on ourselves. However, the Jewish concept was no focus on other people. When you use and when, when you use a candle, you could not only light up for yourself, you light up for everybody else. When you eat something, you're only helping yourself and probably affecting the people all around you depending on what you're eating. So 
This is the idea with splitting. But what, then we come to Edom. We come to the exile that we are in today. What, why is it that Abraham, which is the, the bird that is, a, the, I just gave it up, the animal that is associated with the exile of Edom is a bird. What does the Pasu call a, do, a, a bird? It calls it a gozel. Gozel in Hebrew means to steal. What is the concept of Edom? Edom, we, we each said a different, uh, you know, Babylon had power. Persia had immorality, a beauty. You have, um, Greece had intellectualism, Abu if you want to call it. So, when you come to Edom, what does Edom have? And the answer that we gave last week is Edom is a combination of all those, those three together. Now, that is the concept of a gozel. Gozel is a thief, someone who steals, a bird. One of the ways they say a bird is a gozel. That uh, this Edom, what it did was is it stole from everybody else, their own ideology. So whenever they wanted to be, you know, the powerhouse, they wanted to go and murder, so they took from Babel. Whenever they wanted to focus on morality, then they focused on, on Persia. Whenever they wanted to go on intellectualism, atheism, all these ideologies, they focused on, on Greece. So this is, is uh, you know, the, this is also why we see when, I've, when Yaakov Avinu was fighting the angel of Esaf. And Yaakov Avinu asked, he says, what is your name? Tell me your name. What did the angel respond to him? Lama me. Why is it that you want to know my name? Why do you want to know my name? He didn't want to answer his name. Why? Because the angel of Esaf, a name represents a purpose, an action, a, a, a goal, a focus. Uh, that Esav, Edom, has no goal or purpose. It decides, it changes. One day it's like this, another day it's like this. One day it's like this, another day it's like that. It, it, it constantly changes. So, when you're going and when you're thinking about that, what we ended off last, last uh, two weeks ago, is that every other ideology, we could beat it. How do we beat it? We have different sides of the, of the, of the coin. You want, you, know, you want to focus on one aspect of power, we can focus on a different aspect of power. But when we come to Edom, and when Edom doesn't have an ideology, Edom just keeps on flip-flopping. It's like a bipolar, tripolar, right? It keeps on going to different ideologies and switches depending on one. How do you beat someone when you go and say, hey, by the way, this is wrong what you're doing. They'll be like, okay, fine. And they switch a different ideology, which is equally as wrong. And say, this is wrong also. They'll be like, okay, fine. And then they switch another ideology. You can't win some. The concept over here is something very important that if you're going and, and um, let's say you're speaking to somebody about religion, Judaism, oh, whatever, the truth is could be anything, but they don't want to change whatever, they, it can be about health, about eating healthy. The, if they don't want to change, they're going to find every single excuse in the book to go and say that what they're doing is really okay, and what they're doing is really not a problem. So how can you change somebody that doesn't want to change? You can't. So when you're dealing with the concept of Adam, Adam is, is, is not only that they don't want to change, even when they know that they're wrong, they're constantly changing what they decide that they are. It's like somebody who keeps on changing, who, you know, think about it this way, um, and I've dealt with this before, it's hilarious in a very sad way. When you're speaking to somebody who claims he's an atheist, and then you go and you convince him that he's really not an atheist because he doesn't know the term, simple definition of an atheist, and be like, you know what, okay fine, I'm an agnostic. And then two days later he's speaking to somebody else and then he's an atheist again. And then he's, no, then, then he's like anything, in I don't know if there's anything in between. I'm sure there are like different categories in between. You believe in spirituality, you believe in karma, you know, like different levels of idiocracies that people have. So, uh, but if they're constantly changing, so if you go and you say, okay, you're not this, and then they switch and they say, okay, fine, you know what, you're right, I'm not this, I'm something else. And then you convince them and say, you know what, you're not this either. And be like, okay, fine, now I'm back to this one again. And be like, well, no, no, what do we just do? And then they keep on switching. You can't fight somebody that keeps on switching who they are. So now the question that we left off with, and this is where we could start today's, uh, you know, topic, is how do you beat the tom? How is it possible if you cannot fight them then how do you beat them? How do you beat somebody you cannot, you, you, you know, you, they, they, there's no definition to how to, to how to begin to understand it. So we're going to begin, we're going to continue actually with the Brit Ben Absalim, the covenant of the parts. This is also, this is uh, mentioned from Rabbi Israel uh, Tauber. Rabbi Israel Tauber was uh, somebody who founded the Or Sameach in Mansi, over here. Did tremendous amount of good. So, so he brings down something very, very fascinating. That after Avraham caught the animals, vultures, uh, animals of prey, descended upon the carcasses, upon the dead animals, and they wanted to eat it. So Abraham went and he tried to go and, and scare them, uh, you know, scare them away. And what does the Pasuk says? The Pasuk in Bereshit, in Genesis, chapter 15, verse 11, it says, Vayeret hayait al hapagim. The vulture, the, the, the animals, the birds of prey, went and landed on the dead animals, on the carcasses. Vayeshev otam Abraham, and Abraham chased them away. So now, the Midrash goes and says that what happened was Abraham tried to take a heavy instrument and tried to kill the vultures, these birds of prey. But he wasn't able to, he wasn't successful, and only afterwards, somehow, we're going to see later how, he was able to save the dead animals, he was able to save the carcasses. So, first let's try to analyze this, this, uh, this cryptic, uh, you know, pasuk. What is it, why is it specifically the vultures? Vultures is a, a um, is, is a, is, is a type of bird. And we said a bird is associated with a dom. Now, it's very interesting, when you look at the pasuk, it starts off, it says, the, the, 
vulture, singular, went down. And then it says, Vayeshev Otam Abraham, and Abraham returned them. Otam is, is plural. So the Pasuk starts off with singular, and then it ends off with plural. Now the question is, if there are many birds, then you say there are many birds that came down, and then you drove many of them away. But if there was one bird, it should be both the same. Why is it that the, Abraham, that the Pasuk started off with a singular, and then it ended off in plural? And the answer is because the concept of Edom is many different faces. They have a face of Babel, they have a face of Persia, they have a face of, of Greece. They have different faces, different ideologies that they want to, but it's all under one umbrella. It's all under the umbrella of Edom. So even though they have many different um, ideologies, understandings, it's all under one concept of Edom. So when Abraham was able to somehow chase this bird away, he fell into a sleep. And the Midrash says that he had a prophetic vision of the end of days. And he saw that his descendants, the Jewish people, are going to fall victim you know, to, to a few exiles. Number one, there's going to be the exile of Babel, where the Jewish people are going to die physically. Then you're going to have the exile of Persia, where the Jewish people are going to die in this sort of a uh, uh, immoral aspect. They're going to come like this quasi-religious type of uh, you know, aspect, where their heart is affected by it. And then you have the, the exile of Greece, where it comes with intellectual foreign ideologies, uh, that they're going to get involved in. And each of these ideologies, you know, like Abraham wanted to go and, and, and get the Jews back, but there was something that, that, you know, was holding back. And then he saw Edom. Edom was where they got everybody together. Everybody together. And he tried to, as much as he could to save the Jewish people. And what, how did he do that? By, by trying to go and kill these, these birds. The birds that are associated by Edom, he tried to kill them. But he wasn't able to do it. So what did he do? When he saw that he couldn't go and say and, and, and kill and the, the vultures, what he did was, is that instead of focusing, the Midrash says, instead of focusing on the vultures, he, focuses, he focused on the carcass. And what he did was, something fascinating, the Midrash says, that he brought them back to life. He brought the carcasses back to life, and that's how he was able to save them. Now, it's something very interesting. Let's look at this, the, the, the Pasuk, when we mentioned before. It says that he chased the birds away, but the word that is used for chase, it says, Vayashev Otam Abraham. Vayashev is the same words that used for lashuv, is to return. And to return is also the same thing, the same, same uh, um, uh, I guess, the shalash, the same root of tshuva. And what he did was, is that there was two things to focus over here. When he realized that he wanted to destroy a dome. But how do you destroy a dome when they keep on changing who they are? You can't destroy them. So when you can't go on your offense, what do you have to do? You have to build your defense. So instead of focusing on Edom, he focused on the Jewish people. It says instead of going and trying to kill them, let's strengthen the, the, the Jewish people. And how did he do that? By Yashev. How, what was by Yashev? Is to go and back to do tshuva. When he was able to get the Jewish people to do tshuva, that's how he was able to go and chase the, the birds away, Edom away. And that is the way that you are able to, to, uh, um, to beat Edom. Now, the thing that we have to understand is this is a prophecy in, in, you know, in the future, or maybe today, we'll try to see how this, how this works, where Avraham is going to go and basically bring back to life those that are dead, right? So we said over here, just a quick recap, because I know it's a little bit, you have to like follow a little, a little bit over here. As soon as it's gonna get a little bit lighter. So what happened was is that Abraham saw, um, he, he cut all the animals, right? He cut all that except the birds. Now what happened with the birds? He couldn't cut it, why? Because Adam had different faces. And then he had the, the vultures trying to go and, and capture these, uh, you know, get the, the, you know, the carcasses. And he was able to chase them away. But how was he able to chase them away? He was able to chase them away by focusing on the Jewish people and getting them to return to do tshuva. Meaning, what, what was the Jewish people referring, of, referring to up here? The carcasses, meaning dead, the dead Jews. Now, what is referring to the dead Jews? The dead Jews over here are referring to spiritually dead, meaning that the, the Jewish people that, that will, be a, will come to a point where they have absolutely no association with Judaism. They don't know anything about anything. A, a level that's so dire, so low, that they don't even understand the basics of Judaism. And when that's going to happen, when they have no ligaments, no nothing, that's when they're going to be able to go and be able to return. That's when Abraham is going to come in and I'm going to give the merit of Abraham is going to be able to go and return the Jewish people. Now, if this is not, the, if, if, I don't know, unless you're living under a rock, this is what we're dealing with today. Today, this is where the Jewish people are. The Jewish people are in a dead state. You think about it, it's something amazing. It, I'll tell you like this, regarding the converts. Um, so when you're dealing with, with converts, it's something very interesting. Yeah, you see, I, and I see this time and time again, where, where somebody goes and converts, and later they find out that they were actually Jewish. They'll find out, that there's so many. I know evangelical Christians. If anybody, those are the Hasidim of the Christian world. Those are the highest of the highest level of the, the like their goal is to go and try to go and, and, fo and try to get everybody else to become Christian. Like, and that's where their goal is, right? So when, 
these, you know, like, and, and, they, and I, I know people that from that sect, they went and they became Jewish. And then they realized only later that their ancestors was really Jewish. And there's a very famous person who wrote a book also um, that uh, she was also Christian and then she converted and then she found out she was a Murano. She's from, the, from, you know, from uh, Spain and we actually brought her in here years ago to you know, think of a class. So when, when, when you look at it, the, the Jewish people are going to be so alienated, then there's going to be something, there, there's going to be a, a, like the merit of, of all of a sudden Abraham is going to come in and awaken the dead animals, the dead, which is, which is really referring to the dead Jews, spiritually dead Jews, out of nowhere are going to come back to Judaism. Would you think about it and be like, why? Like, how does that even work? But before we even get to that, we have to understand, why is it Abraham? Why not Yitzchak? Why not Yaakov? Why out of all the forefathers does it come to Abraham? Because what happens is, let's say Yitzchak comes and says to a Jew, you got to come, you got to do tshuva, you got to return to the Jewish nation, you got to return to your roots. Be like, come on, you're telling me you had a father of Abraham, you had a son of Yaakov, you're telling me this? What about if Yaakov comes and says, hey, you got to go back to Judaism, you got to go back to your roots? It'd be like, really? You're your father was Yitzhak, your grandfather was Abraham, you know, your mother's war, you know, like, you know, your grandmother, you have so much, this is what you're dealing with? But comes Abraham, what does Abraham have to deal with? Abraham did not have a religious parents. Right? You're talking about the typical situation that you're dealing with nowadays. Not only that Abraham's parents not be like, listen, I support your decision of what you want to do. Um, I don't agree with it, but if you want, you have my full support. And uh, it, it didn't work like that, Abraham. The, his father brought him to the, you know, to the king in Imad, and he threw him into the furnace for what they did. The father was not all for him going and finding the one God, the true, the, the, you know, the true purpose of the world. And you see what nowadays, something very interesting, that you have the same Jewish people that they come, and I deal with this, I deal with this on a daily basis, where you have people that go and they say, listen, I would love to keep Shabbat. I would love to keep kosher, I love, but my parents don't let me. They force, I know people, the parents force them to break Shabbat. They force, this, if, this is not, so what happens? So Abraham goes and says, listen, now I can wake you up. Be like, what do you know? Be like, what do I know? I dealt the same situation that you dealt. If not more, did your parents throw you to the fire? No, okay, so you can take my advice. You can talk about where I'm coming from. So this is why the matter specifically Abraham is coming over here. Abraham is going to come in the end of days, the day, these days. Abraham is going to come and he's going to awaken the Jewish people, the people that are spiritually dead. And that's what you see going on all around. Things that you never thought you would see before. People that are completely alienated from Judaism, all of a sudden coming back and you want to think why what are you doing like really what what I mean like no I don't want to ask too many questions you know like first you buy the product then you ask the questions <laughs> especially if it's a good deal but when you come and you think about it, like how is it possible that you have Jewish people coming from the most remote remote parts of their spiritual beings like they're so spiritually dead and all of a sudden they come back to life if you don't start stop thinking about this be like how does this work how is it even possible this is the merit of Avraham Avinu so you want to know how to beat a dome, the exile that we're on right now, it's not about focusing. You can't beat a dome. You can't focus on a dome. You can't focus on the offense. You've got to focus on your defense. You've got to build yourself up. When we return to do tshuva, that's how we're going to go and we're, beat, and we're going to beat the dome. That's where the, the animals are going to come back to life and that's where we're going to be able to bring the Mashiach and, and, and go back to the path that we need to go back to. So now, there is a pasuk in Dvarim that speaks about what happens in the end of days. It's in Dvarim in chapter 30, verse 1. It says, When all these things, these things happen to you, the blessing and the curse, and the pasuk finished, the middle of the pasuk is, And you're going to return from amongst all the nations. Now there's something very interesting. What the pasuk over here is referring to is that after all the good, all the blessings and all the curses, you know what this means? That means is that after that you're going to have the first Beit and after you're going to have the second Beit HaMikdash, and then you're going to get exiled, and then you're going to go, and then there's going to be the Spanish Inquisition, and there's going to be a Holocaust, and then there's going to be pogroms, there's going to be so many problems with Jewish people, and after all that, you know what's going to happen? The Jewish people, they're going to return back, the, the hearts are going to return back. Now the Bab goes and explains this, and says that you won't be able to express it. Like, it's not something that you could be like, like why, like, why are the Jews doing this? So if you ask, like, why are the Jews, like, how is it, like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, why are you coming back from such a far away? We won't be able to explain it, but it's going to be something that's going to be in your heart. It's going to be something that's going to be, that's in the Jewish heart, that's, there's going to be like a longing, like a wanting to come closer to God. Something that, you know, is, is sort of unprecedented where we had before. Now, when you look at about 40 years ago, the way that the Jewish, maybe, maybe a little bit more, someone sent me a picture. I don't know if I should say this on camera, but I'm going to say it anyways, but um, I don't know if I should. Um, and someone sent me a picture for a uh, Bet Yaakov school in America, I think it was 1952. It was 1952, and so Bet Yaakov is, a, is like a Jewish 
girls. How do I explain? I don't know. Whatever. If you don't know this, I don't. I can't help you. Like a bisaco? Yeah, bisaco. Yeah. Right. So it was one of them. It was more than one that opened up. So it was one of them. So the um, and they sent me a picture. And it was very interesting why they sent me the picture because the, the, the women were not dressed modestly. And I was like, so I responded back, oh, no, they're like short sleeves, like, you know, like, a, you know, not like a scene. And I sent back and I'm like, um, are you sure this is a base Yaakov? Yeah. And they were like, yeah. you saw this? You saw that picture? And so there was, he responded to me, he's like, yeah, no, that's base Yaakov. And I'm like, this doesn't look like base Yaakov. You know, like, where was it? Like, was this like a different thing? He's like, he, he's, uh, and, uh, and he's like, no, he's like, that's the whole point. Like back then, Beis Yaakov was on a completely different level than it was right now. Like if you go back, back then, it was normal that people wore short sleeves and it was a different world. It's, it, this is referring to America. America was a more of a modern society, still is, but it was back then even the Jews were in a modern society until the yeshiva world, you know, like, you know, built it up. But the concept was, it was something very interesting. You look at it now, you, you look at it back then, 50 years ago, and be like, so what do you think the yeshiva, what do you think Beis Yaakov is going to be like in 50 years from now or 70 years from now? Be like, what? It's going to be co-ed. Going to be, you know, they're, they're not. <laughs> now, like the good base Jacob, you have to wear, you know, special tights that bullets cannot penetrate, right? <laughs> so, which is a good thing. Again, I'm not arguing with it. And you have to go and you have to, you know, cover, uh, according to Allah, very good. It's supposed to be like that. I, I, I'm not mocking it. It's supposed to be that way. But if you go back 70 years and be like, hey, what's going to be like in the future? Be like, are you in the future? It's going to get much worse. But you look at it, it's switched around. Not only that it, got, it did not get worse, it got so much stronger, so much better, so much appropriate, so much ka'alacha, the way that it's supposed to go. And when you think about it, be like, why? How is it possible? How is it possible that you have the people, usually you go in a downward spiral, not in an upward spiral, but now what we see, that people are going in an upward, uh, an upward direction, not in a downward direction. Something very fascinating. Now, what goes, even, what goes even more interesting is that, who do you expect to do tshuva? Who do you expect somebody to go back to? People that, let's say, were religious, maybe went off. Maybe the people that come from a, from, a, from a religious home, they became even more religious. That's who you expect to come back. But that's not what's happening. You have, well, it's, it's, also, it's also happening. But what you're having over here is something very fascinating. That you have people that came from the leftist, you know, the, the, the left-wing family, the, you know, homes. Atheistic homes, where they went and they convinced their children that there is no God. And somehow, by the mercy of God, the children decide that they want to follow God. And they go and they come back to the, to, you know, to the Jewish nation. This is what it means. It says, Vashavata Shabbat levavecha bechol agoyim. Amongst all the, all the nations, even in the worst of the worst, we have people that are not in the religious world at all, and somehow they turn back. The, a, a very unfortunate statistic is that there are many in the, in the cults in the world, there are many Jews that are involved in cults. And um, there was one story that Rabbi Tyler brings down, that there was once a Far East you know, religion, you know, one of those that we are like a robe, on the side, you know, like a yellow robe, they sit in like a, mm, you know, situation. Um, and they were offering like a week-long, you know, seminars on like understanding yourself better, whatever it is, you know, like all the nonsense. So anyway, so um, they're signing people up. It costs, you know, it costs like a thousand dollars, something like that. And they're signing people up. And then all of a sudden, you have this, this elder Jewish woman signed up, Mrs. Schwartz. Like, like, like the typical, like the shaitel, like everything, like fully. She goes up and she signs on for this. Now the people that are going and they're, you know, they're, they're collecting the money, they're like, what are you doing here? Like, they don't see Jews over there. I mean, if they see Jews, they don't look like Jews. I know that this one is not only a Jew, but it looks like a Jew, the son of a Jew, the daughter of a Jew, like a real Jew. You know, um, so, but you know, she's paying good money, so they take her. And they notice the, the people that are organizing the event is that she sits all the way in the back and she attends every single lecture that is given. But she doesn't listen to one word that they're saying. She's sitting in the back and she's knitting. That's all she's doing. For a week long, she's sitting and she's knitting. And they're all like, like why didn't she even come? Like, what is the whole purpose of this? And uh, you know, the week goes by, and at the end of the last seminar, they're like, OK, we're, you know, we're advertising now for the next seminar, which is going to be a month long. It's going to be like a few thousand dollars. A month long to get really in depth on what this you know, cult, whatever it is, you know, the, this ideology is. And uh, whoever wants to sign up can, you know, after the lecture, go and come, you know, come over, you know, to the, you know, to the side and sign up. So you had only a handful of people that decided they wanted to sign up. Who was one of those handful of people? This Mrs. Schwartz. <laughs> she's up there, right over there in the first. And she takes out her checkbook. She's like, "How much it is?" Writes it right away, and, so, and they take the money. And they're like, "She didn't even listen to one class. Like, why is she even coming?" A month goes by. She comes over to this, you know, she comes to this month-long seminar, you know, like this, this retreat. And she goes over there. She comes again to every single class. 
But again, she sits in the back. She's knitting sweaters for everybody. Like, but she's not listening to a single class that's going on, a single thing that we're saying. And at the end of this like, month-long seminar, they are so excited, the, the organizer, that they said, we have something unprecedented. We're going over here now. We're, we're, if you want to go, you want to go to Tibet and, and speak to the actual guru himself, then you could go and you could, you know, if you pay like, you know, $15,000, it's going to cover the ear fear and the, you know, the grass that you're going to eat, whatever it is, right? So whatever it is that they eat, um, all your meditation, you know, I don't know what is it called. What is that, the, the yoga instructor? Mats that you need to sit on and sleep on and live on. Everything is going to be covered. And uh, so there's also, out of the entire seminar, a few people signed up. Who was the first one? Mrs. Schwartz. They're like, what is wrong with this woman? Like, well, she's paying it. Like, all right, so we'll take the money. They take the money and uh, they sign her up. And they get on this, you know, eventually when the time comes to depart, they get on this bus, they go to the airplane, they follow to one airplane, they go to another airplane that's wrapped with duct tape, you know, and they go to this like far remote island that no one ever heard of. And then they go up to this like mountain in Tibet and uh, they're sitting over there and you see there, there was a line, there was a crazy, crazy line. Not like a Black Friday line, you know, I don't know if that exists anymore, but I'm talking about like a line where people are waiting, camping out for weeks, waiting to speak to the guru, the holy guru, that's what they're waiting for. And uh, the, she goes over there, and they all they just wait in line. And she's sitting over there. A day or two goes, the, you know, goes by. Then suddenly, there's somebody walks past by and be like, "There is an express line. For certain people, there's an express line. Who are the people that go on the express line? If you have only three words or less to say, then you can go on the express line." So uh, nobody, I mean, people want to speak to the girl. They're waiting. They flew out of here. They paid 15 grand. They're gonna speak. They're gonna. They want to spend some time. Who is the one that decides in three words is enough? Mrs. Schwartz. You raise your hands. Be like, I only have three words. Be like, you. They're like, okay. Now, like the entire, the entire like organization, like we're like, they were just like follow. She three, she's been coming here for who knows how long. Give me all the money. What is she gonna say in for three words? So she goes and 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 she starts walking up to the guru, and everybody's like, there's like a crowd behind, like all her followers. They're like, what is these three words are gonna be? And she gets in front of the guru, and she looks at the guru in the eyes, and she goes, David come home. The guru was her son. You know what I know the saddest part of this? This is based off a true story. And he ended up coming home. He ended up coming home to, you know, with, you know, you know, with his mother. We have over here, there are so many people that are the most far remote places in the world that all of a sudden before Mashiach comes, there's going to be something that's going to stir inside of you. Now there's things that you could do. There are people, it, it, it comes in every single one of us. But the question is, are you going to utilize that sort of like awakening that you have inside of you? Or are you going to shut it up? and put it in the corner and be like, shh, don't talk. You know, like Papa or Mama's putting you in the corner you know, for the rest of your life. I don't want to hear my conscience. I don't want to deal with it. So you have two options over here. There's a little voice inside of you that comes in the mouth of Aham that says, hey, come on, return to Judaism. Return to the really the proper way. And you have the ability to either go and listen to it or go and put it in the corner and not listen to it anymore. Rabbi Zil Tabot goes and says a story that happened to him. They said that he one time got a phone call from one of, uh, he, he used to teach also, you know, a woman, and one of the women that used to come to his classes called him up and says, listen, there's a girl that they just met that came from this like far off, far east religion, Jewish girl. She's been here for two months. What was her focus? To study mysticism. She came to New York to study the Jewish mysticism. And for two months she's been going and she's studying, she's going to every lecture on Kabbalah and, and anything that's mystical in Judaism, that's what she's been studying. And tomorrow she's leaving. And she went and she spoke to one of the girls in this Rabbi Tower's class. And she said, you know, by the way, I spent here two months. I focused everything on the Jewish mysticism, and I see all does nothing for me. She says, I'm going back to my, you know, to, you know, to, to this uh, place where it was. It's called Tibet. I don't know where she was going. She's going to, back to Tibet. And uh, she's go, returning back to her Far East uh, cult. So this girl from the class calls up the rabbi and says, please, you've got to meet with her. And the rabbi says, when am I going to meet with her? She went to classes for two months and nothing, well, I'm going to meet with her. And he says, but listen, there's a Jewish woman that wants to be met. Fine, I'll speak to her. So she's flying out the next day, and they, just, they, they made up, they're going to meet at 8 o'clock. When she, when, when she comes to meet the rabbi, she tells the rabbi, I have only an hour that I'm able to stay over here. She says, fine. So the rabbi starts showing her Torah codes. How there's different codes in the Torah that is not improbable, impossible for any human being to be able to put this inside. And they end up talking till midnight. So instead of one hour, they end up talking to four hours. And at the end of that, she was, she, she, you know, she was like, listen, you know, this is something that I have to you know, consider. I'd like, I've never heard this before. This cannot be made up. This cannot be something that just happens by chance. So the rabbi told her, why don't you go and uh, stay in and you know, research more about this? So she says, I have to think about it. I don't know. I have to think about it. And uh, the next day, the student 
that originally tried to make the shidduch or arrange this, calls up the rabbi and she says she overheard a conversation that she had with her guru. And she was telling the guru, says, listen, he says, you know, like, you know, I've done my research for the past two months and I found something that needs to be uh, further looked into. And the guru said, stay. Look into it more. And uh, she said, fine. And she decided that she's going to stay. And she ended up staying. And a short while later, not only did she completely become religious, she actually lives in Jerusalem, has a family, and uh, you know, like, like a completely religious, religious family. But you want to know something amazing that, that, that's sad, that amazingly sad, that well, how did she get up to the Far East uh, you know, religion? Is that she went over, and I'm using air quotes to her rabbi, again, air quotes, and she says, I want to learn about mysticism. You're talking about, she was 15 years, she was, um, 15 years ago we're talking about. And she went to her rabbi and says, I want to learn about mysticism. He says, oh, you want to learn about mysticism? Not Judaism. Go to the Far East. You want to go? Go to India. Maybe that's where you're going to find something about, about mysticism. So she went over there to find mysticism. And you know what the guru told her? You want to find mysticism? Go to New York. Go, go listen to some Kabbalah classes. That's where you're going to find mysticism. But the biggest kicker was, says, why did the guru send her out over there to go and, and follow up and learn about mysticism? Is because she was, she, was, she was being trained to be the next guru. That was her, that's what she was going to be. And somehow something clicked in her the last moment. She had a ticket booked the next day to go back. And something clicked in the last moment, and not only that, that she like grabbed onto that and she went with it. And where is she now? She has a full religious family. Like, it, think about, like, how is that even possible? How is that even possible? Because you know what the Pesuk says? Amongst all the nations, the farthest out Jews possible, before Mashiach comes, are going to have this awakening. And they have the ability. Are they going to return, or are they not going to return? Now, the, that is the first Pasuk in Devarim, in the, first, in the uh, chapter 30, verse 1. What is the second, the second uh, verse over there? It says, You're going to return to your God. You're going to listen to His voice. To everything that I'm commanding to you today. You and your children. But now you're not going to listen to God just like regular. With all your heart, with all your soul. Now, this second type of Tshuva, is referring to a different, a, a different type of a Jew. The first thing that we spoke about, that's a secular Jew. This, the second pasuk in, in the chapter 30th of Devarim is referring to a religious Jew. What's going to happen? That you have observant Jews, people that are religious, and they're doing mitzvot, but they're not doing it for the sake of heaven. They're not doing it for the right reasons. What's going to happen is, is that all of a sudden something's going to come also during the end of days that they're going to start waking up and they're going to return and they're going to do tshuva also but this is going to be with all your heart, with all your soul. Now, this is regarding in anything that when you go and when you convey something to your children the children are able to see if something is authentic or something is not authentic. If you think about it like this, in order for a, any fruit to be able to reproduce it has to be authentic. If it's synthetic it's not going to be, if it's man-made, it's not going to be able to re reproduce. So if you want to present a character trait, an ideology, an, an idea to your children, if you're not authentic in it, you could talk from today to tomorrow, people could see that. People could see like, okay, you're just saying words, uh, you know, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to really take it into it. But if you want to be able to go and, and bring it to your children, it has to be really be authentic. And that's what you see, unfortunately, the reform, conservative movements, even, unfortunately, modern orthodox movements, how do their children usually end up? They don't usually end up exactly the same as the parents. They get slowly and slowly further and further away. In fact, that's how you see reform and conservative in general. It gets further and further away from the Torah. First, you weren't allowed to marry you know, only Jews. And then eventually, you're allowed to marry Jews. Now, it's a mitzvah to marry men and men. What are, like, they do things and they go to levels. They keep on going further and further away. What are the Jewish, what are the Jewish people? The Jewish people at a certain point in time that are reform are, you know, are going to have to go through some conversion. Because how do you know that they're Jewish? Even though they could say that they went to Reform Temple, but how do you know? Like, it's gone so far down. Why? Because they're not conveying an authentic ideology. They're conveying something, yeah, you know, you, the Torah says that you have to keep Shabbat, you have to keep kosher, you have to marry a Jew, you have to do certain things. But, yeah, that's the old version. Now we have a re renewed version. But they don't even, they, you know, like, when you're, you're conveying something that's not really truthful, and it's not really authentic, the children pick up on it. And they say, well, if you don't care about it, pops and mom, then why do I care about it? And they go keep on going less and less. But what's going to happen, is in the end of days, which is where we're holding on today, is that all of a sudden the Jewish people are gonna, are gonna even, the, even the religious people, where they're sort of just like going through the motion, and unfortunately this happens to many of us, where we're, we're religious, but like we're just like doing the motion. Like when was the last time, it's very unfortunate when people go and they pray, and then they're like, wait, I'm finished praying already. And then you think of something, did I pray? I mean like, I turned the pages, like I, I, was, I was there, probably said the words, 
And then like you don't have any recollection of anything that you did. But it's even more so, like sometimes you go and you come to a class, a Torah class, or you listen to a Torah, or you read a book, and you finish reading, listening, whatever it is that you're doing, and be like, what, what did he speak about? Like I was there, I was physically there, but like, oh, ugh. you know, like, you know, like, I don't know what, you know, what, what, you know, I have no clue what the, what the person spoke about it. Now, what is the difference? Like, how could some people can go and they could read a book or, or read a sefer or read, or listen to a Torah class and they come out knowing something? The answer is depending if you're doing it full heartedly, if something that you enjoy, something that you want, something that you anticipate, then you understand, that you under, then, then you know. You know, when you're dealing with, let's say. It could be anybody from a plumber to a technician, doesn't matter. You want to know what's a good plumber? Not somebody you know, that, that, that you know, has the, the, the most sophisticated appliances or the best advertisement. Somebody who loves what they do. Because they're like, like crazy about it. Like if they're crazy about it, then they know what they're talking about. They, know, they learn everything about it. So if you're like crazy about Judaism, if you're crazy about God, then you'll know everything. You'll come to our Torah class, you'll remember everything. You're reading a book, you're going to remember everything because you're like crazy about God. You're like involved, you're associated, you're like devoted to, you know, to it. And that's the difference when you're doing something is what the Pasuk is saying. When you're doing something with all your heart, with all your soul, so what's, what the Pasuk is saying is now that you're going to have the religious Jews, the Jews that were born and raised religious. But what's going to change all of a sudden? They're going to do something with a different, uh, different, uh, a different oomph into it. They're always going to do something that with all their heart, no more 80% Judaism, 70% Judaism. Judaism on weekends and holidays and then the rest of the time whenever I decide it. Judaism is going to be all that they care about. This is, and this is what you see nowadays. You have people that, I, you know, like, I don't know how they get anything else done in their day, but I know people that listen to eight lectures a day online. And I'm like, do you do anything else? Like, wh how is that even possible? You know, because like they're working, they're driving, and they're utilizing everything. They're so connected, so devoted, so connected to God that everything that they're doing is focusing on God. And it's something so unbelievable. And this is what's happening at the end of days. That the people are going to be doing tshuva, you're going to have two different types of people doing tshuva. You have people that are going to be, that, that's going to be from the far out, the, you know, with all the, the, the nations, amongst all the nations, in the far east, in the Christian world, in the Islam, in, from all the, all of a sudden they're going to come back to Judaism. And then you're going to have the people that are going to come back to Judaism, but with a much stronger like, power to it. Who are those people? Those are people that were religious from the beginning. Now there's a very, very interesting pasuk in, in, uh, in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 33 verse 13, it says, Shimu Chokim, listen those that are far off. Asher Asisi, that which I did, v'udu kovim gvuati, I know the close ones, know my might. Now Rashi says something very, very, very fascinating, a big chidush. There is gachokim, those that are far and those that are near. Now if I were to tell you that you have two people, either secular or religious, and they come closer to God, who would you call far and who would you call near? So ordinarily, who would you call far? The people that were never religious, all of a sudden becoming religious. Who would you call near? The people that were always religious. Says Rashi, no. Says, who are the far off? Those who believed in me from their youth. Those who are, what are they called, FFBs? I guess what are we called? From, from birth, right? Those are, far, those are going to be the ones that are far off. Who are going to be the ones that are near? Says Rashi, the repentant sinners, the people that were sinning their entire life and have recently drawn close to God. Now the question is, why is it like that? It should be the opposite. And the answer is, yeah. This is what Rashi says. Straight out, this is what, this is, yeah. This is, uh, well, it's, it, it's referring to listen and hear, but yeah. This is basically what uh, the Pasuk says. And what's going to happen is, and by the way, when are you going to have the sinners that are going to return? Before, 200 years ago, before the Reform Haskalah movement, before the, the, you know, the Jewish nation took a very sharp left turn, uh, you know, the, the majority of the Jews were religious. You always had sinners, but the majority of Jews were religious and orthodox. That was, that's all that you basically had. So when these prophecies are speaking, they're speaking about these days. They're speaking about where we're dealing with right now. Now, why is it that the ones that are far are the ones that were religious from birth and the ones that are near are the ones that all of a sudden are slowly coming to God? And the, one of the, the, you know, the, the interpretations to understand this is that let's say you have two children. One was born to a wealthy family and one was born to a very poor family. And after they get married, they both make a lot of money. Who is going to appreciate the money more? The wealthy one that was born to a wealthy family or the one that was born in a poor family? And the answer is the one that was born in a poor family, that's the one who's going to appreciate it more. And that's what's happening you know, nowadays. We, who appreciates Judaism more? The people who really appreciate Judaism more are the ju people that were never religious, never knew anything about Judaism. If you want chizuk, if you really want a, you know, to get like this, this like strength, go watch a Baal Tshuva pray. Watch somebody, and they're not going to pray in Hebrew. They don't know how to be Hebrew. They pray in English. And you see how they pray in English. 
and they say everything. They don't know what they need to say. They say the instructions also. You know, they go and they say, if you forget to say Allah Yabba, you're supposed to repeat it. And they just keep on going. They say the entire thing. And you know what a Shmona Esa takes them? 45 minutes. <coughs> 45 minutes it takes them. That's what's happening, you know, and, and, and that's really what, what you're dealing with, you know, in, in today's days. And, and I see this all the time. It's, it's unbelievable. You see somebody sitting there, just started praying. You see how they pray every single word as if they're speaking to God. Now you watch that person three years later, two years or whatever it is. I don't know why I can't match it, right? <laughs> two years later or three years later, um, you go is what happens when your brain thinks, you know, faster than your you know, body works. The, um, when, you, when you look at them, all of a sudden they're praying so fast. You know, Hebrew ready, they're going so fast. What happened all of a sudden? There was a newness. There was a connection to it. Now there's something very, very interesting. You know what happens is that... How does, it, how, does it, how does it work that we said that you have the religious people are coming closer to God and then you have the secular people coming closer to God? What happens is that first you have the secular people, people that were never associated with religion. They're going to come closer to God. And all of a sudden the religious people are going to see the secular people and be like, you know what? And that's going to, that's going to give them the chizuk. That's going to give them the power. Be like, that's how he's praying. That's how she's praying. That's how I need to pray. And all of a sudden they're, they're way that they pray is going to utilize your way to pray and all of a sudden you're going to you're going to increase yourself in, in you know in your thing that's why the first the first pasuk in Devarim chapter 30 the first one speaks about the secular Jews and after the secular Jews come back that's when the religious Jews could come back because then when the religious Jews can see oh that's the way that you're supposed to be a Jew the you know, when you're dealing with tshuva, and when you're dealing with the concept of this is what happens right before Mashiach comes, right before Mashiach comes, there's going to be a wave of tshuva. So you're going to have to be like, it's very difficult. You know, like you think about tshuva, be like, I can't change. It's so hard. Oh, like, I'm not really up for that. I can't really do this. So the Pasuk says in Dvarim, chapter 30, verse 12, that it says, Ki mitzvah azot, that this commandment, that I am commanding today, to the, you today, this is not concealed from you, but it's not distant from you. Says the Sephora, you know what the, this mitzvah that this pasuk is referring to? It's referring to tshuva. People think that tshuva is very difficult. The pasuk says, no, no, no. This mitzvah of tshuva, it's not only, it's not concealed, it's not, and it's not going to be difficult for you. All you got to do is you got to start. Once you start, God's going to take you the rest of the way. And this is why people, you know, I've had people ask me, like, why do I do what I do? You know, like, why do I, you know, you know, well, again, if you don't know anything about me, just, I don't know, I can't, I can't I don't have time to speak about what I do. Um, but why do I do what I do? And, uh, you know, one of the answers is, is that before Mashiach comes, the entire Jewish nation is going to wake up. Now, there depends on who they're going to wake up with. You have the ability, you know, and to think about it this way, like, you want to pick up a very, very heavy boulder, but you can't pick it up. But what happens is if you have a crane that comes and picks it up. Now, if you want to move it, it's very easy. Once a crane is lifting it up, you could just push it and it moves very easily. Now, we're dealing with, before the Mashiach comes, the Jewish nation for a long time, very stubborn. We still are very stubborn people. We want to stick their way. But before Mashiach comes, there's going to be a crane that lifts the Jewish people up. Now, it depends which way you want to be moved. You're going to be moved either to the atheistic direction, to the unfortunately Christian or Islamic direction or the Far East, Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever it is, or you're going to push into Judaism. But it's very easy to be pushed at this time. Meaning that during, before Mashiach, it's going to be very, very easy to get people to come closer to God. Now, if it's very easy, you have to be a smart businessman in any aspect of your life. Spiritually, physically, emotionally, intellectually, all aspects, you have to be very, very smart in the same business mind. That if you have an opportunity, you have to capitalize it. And you want to know what I personally, there's, here's where I see the biggest opportunity. There's opportunity, there's so many Jews that want to come closer to God. Don't, this is the ability to, be, to you could become a, a spiritual billionaire. You get one person become religious, it's so much, you get, you get more than one, it's unbelievable the power that you have. And now it's so easy, it's like picking up diamonds. All you got to do, they want it. They have that Avraham Avinu that's inside of them, that they're going and say, I want to become religious. So you have the ability right now and give them a few classes, direct them a few places, and all of a sudden they become religious. This is a power that if nobody goes and jumps on it, then you're not a smart businessman or a businesswoman. You don't know how to capitalize it. And during these days, you have to capitalize on the moment and the abilities that you have. During these days, you have the ability to help every single Jew because every single Jew is longing, is thirsting to come closer to God. And you have the ability, very simple, compared to what we had to deal with hundreds of years ago. You know what it means if somebody didn't want to become religious, how difficult it was? Now it's so easy because they have the thirst. They have the Aliyah Avida. They have the Abraham Abinu inside of them that goes and pushes them to come the right thing. So you want to know what I, why I do it? Because I see an opportunity and I want to capitalize on it. And the opportunity is right here, right now. Here's where you have the opportunity to do it. They're going to become religious. Question is, do you want to be part of that equation? 
or do you not want to be part of that equation? If you do, then you will do whatever it is that you have in your power and your ability, whether it's arranging classes, whether it's sending classes to people, whether it's bringing people to classes, whether it's, co it's connecting people to rabbis and showing them the way, whatever, it, because at the end of the day, it's all about the knowledge. It's all about the knowledge that you have that you, that you present. And that's why I say, you know, either lectures or rabbis or books or whatever it is. It doesn't have to be me. It could be anybody. But as long as you direct them, you have the ability to earn spiritual billions of rewards possible. I know that was not correct terminology, but just go with me. So, the, I want to finish off. And when I mean finish off, I mean in a few minutes we're going to finish off. The um, two prophecies. There's a prophecy in Hosea. Chapter 3, verse 4 and verse 5. The two prophecies are going to deal with, one of them is a prophecy in regards to Jews, and one of them is going to be a prophecy in regards to non-Jews in the end of days. The Jews, it says, The Jewish people are going to sit many days without a, no king and no prince. And then what the next pasuk says, afterwards the Jewish people are going to return to, uh, you know, to Judaism. Now, when you think about it, no, no king, no prince means no leadership. Until about 200 years ago, there was leadership. Until before the reform and the Haskalah movement, there was leadership. Every Jew followed his rabbi, his, you know, the, or, the, or the rabbi of the, either the community of the, or the, one of the greatest rabbis of the world. Every Jew followed that. Only recently, within the past 200 years, that people all of a sudden decided that, you know, you know the, the reform, the conservative, uh, you know, the reconstruction, even op open orthodoxy, unfortunately, which is even crazy. You have even people that are religious, either call them modern orthodox or open orthodox, that they go and they get Jewish people out of Judaism. They go the, you know, they go, you go the wrong way. And what's going to happen? There's no leadership. That's what we're dealing with right now. There's no leadership. Even some leadership, unfortunately, is not a leadership. A reform leadership is not a leadership. A conservative leadership is not a leadership. A open orthodox leadership is not a leadership. A modern orthodox leadership is also not a, not a leadership depending on the level of, of, of what their ideology and what their understanding is on the Torah. But you know what authority means? You know what it means to have a king, have a prince? Meaning that everybody has someone to answer to. Every rabbi has a rabbi. That's how you, you want to know who's, you, you want to know if the rabbi, ask him who is his rabbi. Who is the rabbi that he goes to? Who is the rabbi that he goes to? Obviously, once you get, eventually you get up to the far end of the line, you go to Rabbi Chaim Kanevsky, you know, you have the, the Salat Torah, you have the, you know, the highest of the highest, and you know, that's the end of the line. But when you go, but he had a rabbi when he was alive. You have people very, very, like, I, I don't understand it, Baal Tshuva, nowadays, they have, and you ask him, who's your rabbi? I don't have a rabbi. I don't have a thing. Now, this is a problem. Now again, how much of a problem? Depends on the situation. But it's a problem. How do you expect to do something right? E even if you're going and you're listening to classes online, even if you're reading books, but if you don't have a rabbi personally guiding you, personally that you can ask questions to, then you're going to mess up. It's, it's guaranteed that you're going to mess up. That everybody needs to have a rabbi. A rabbi needs to have a rabbi. Everybody needs to have a rabbi. That even when I go to my rabbis and I ask them a question, sometimes the question is so difficult or so complex that they tell me you have to go to their rabbi, like to the next level. And, that's what I said. So after you go to a certain level, then it passed away. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't live anymore. So, um, but, so when you go over here, this is the concept of what you need in, in, the, in the leadership. And unfortunately, this is not what we have nowadays. No prince and no king. That's what the Pasuk is telling us in Hosea. But what's going to be at the end of the days, even without a prince and a king, somehow the Jewish people are going to return. They're going to come back closer to God. Now, that prophecy in Hosea, that's referring to the Jews. There's a prophecy in Isaiah, chapter 33, verse 12 through verse 14. It says over there something very interesting, that the sinners of Zion are going to be afraid. And this is referring to the non-Jews. And there's something over here that Medrash goes and, and explains, like, what, what does it mean that the sinners of the Jewish, of, of Zion, which is Israel, Jewish people, why are they going to be afraid? The Medrash goes and says, Rabbi Yehuda, the son of Rabbi Shimon, goes and says that if, let's say, there was a king that goes and offers, or offers a reward, if somebody captures the head of the criminal activity of the underground world, um, what was his name, Baghdadi? Whatever, I don't know, nobody knows what I'm talking about. Okay, so somebody captures that. that, that you know? no, not the no, lot, I know yeah, somebody said. Al Baghdadi, no, right. Yeah, so <laughs> imagine like that, the leader of ISIS, right? So the, the, you know, the, the king goes and offers a reward, a crazy reward to whoever captures the head of the criminal uh, you know, underground. And uh, one guy goes and is able to capture it. And it's the middle of the night, he brings them over to the king's palace. The king says, put both of them into holding, and tomorrow I'm going to deal with them. Now, both of them are in holding, both of them are shaking, both of them are nervous, both of them are trembling. Now, what is it that one of them, why is, why is the guy 
who, who captured it, why is he shaking? I understand the criminal, he's shaking because he's going to get punished. But why is the guy who caught him trembling? You know why he's trembling? He's like, it's like, what is the king going to give me? Is he going to get, because he didn't mention the reward, but he said a crazy reward. If the king says crazy reward, then you got to think it's a crazy reward. So both of them are trembling. One is trembling for the punishment that they're going to receive. Another one is trembling for the reward that they're going to receive. This is what's going to happen in the end of days. In the end of days, the non-Jews are going to be trembling for all the, the persecution that they went and they went against the Jewish people. The Jewish people are going to be trembling also for the centuries and the millennium that they went and they followed, the, you followed God through the hard and through the good. They're all going to be shaking. And there's something very interesting that I read very recently. The Washington Post in, uh, came out uh, August 19, 2019. Came out an article by Dan Hummel. He is a staff member in the Upper House, a Christian study center in the University of Wisconsin. And you know what, he says something very interesting. Brings out, and this is an article you can read in the Washington Post. We sh you shouldn't open the Washington Post, but uh, just a side note. The, the, um, it was something very interesting that you have Christians that started to f keep Tisha B'Av. So I, like, why were the Christians, the Christians started to keep Tisha B'Av, they started to keep Sukkot. And you know what this Christian scholar, you know, whatever you want to call him, says? He says that they're doing it to do repentance on their past misdeeds. On the, the persecution that the Jews that they had, they felt bad about it. Or everything, the Crusades and everything that they did for the Jewish people, they felt bad. They want to do chuba. They want to do penance. So what are they doing? All of a sudden, they're waking. They're trembling right before Mashiach comes. They're shaking. What do they do? They want to. They, they're starting to keep. They're starting to keep Tisha B'Av. They're starting to keep Sukkot. Something like crazy. Again, they're doing it wrong. That's not the way that you need to do it. But they even go on. They they're very proud supporters of the Israeli army, the IDF. The, you know Israel and they're very strong supporters. By them. you have millions and millions of Christians that are that are strong supporters of Israel. And and some of them, one of the reasons is because they feel bad about what they did. They want to do chuba. They want to do repentance of, for the past for the past, uh, you know, misdeeds. So you have over here something very interesting. You have over here, the, before the end of days, you have the Jews trembling. They're also realizing, okay, what's going to happen over here? They're getting the reward, but also it wakes up a little trembling, a little bit of a Hamavina wakes up inside of them saying, we have to do Shuvah, we have to return. This is both for the secular Jews and for the religious Jews. They're coming and returning back. And then you have even the, the, even the, even the non-Jews, they see, they, they sense something is up. Something is in the air. Something doesn't smell right. Everybody's talking about World War III. They've been speaking about it for years already. Uh, probably since, I don't know, maybe 2001. September 11th, I'd say that's when, like, that's when like, really heavily the world started speaking about you know, uh, you know, World War III. And everybody knows something is brewing. Like, everybody is just like, a, you know, like one, whether you have you know, somebody in what is it, North Korea, you know, like itching to do something, and then you have somebody in the White House that's itching to do something, and then you have Middle East. Everybody's like, it's all like on ne pins and needles. Whether you have, you know, Putin, is he still? What is he? President, king, viceroy, emperor, whatever he calls himself, right? Um, dictator. So, um, you know, so when you, everybody's like on pins and needles of what's going to happen. And everybody senses it. And, and all of a sudden there is a stirring that goes upon both even the, the religious Jews, the secular Jews, and now even you see even the non-Jews. Even the non-Jews sense that something is going on. And now, why is this so important? Somebody told me that it said, he goes like this, he tells me, he says, when Eliyahu and Avi comes, that's when I know Mashiach is coming, that's when I'm going to do tshuva. So that's when I know it's going to do Shabbat. And says so you can't wait until that, that, you know, that point in time. When Mashiach comes, your free will is going to be limited. So what could you, what's the purpose of the era of Mashiach if your free will is going to be limited? And one of the reasons we mentioned before in the name of Rabbi Akiva Tatz, that the concept over here is something very, very important. That we know that Shabbat, you can't really do any melacha. You're not allowed to do anything. But what about Yom Tov? Yom Tov, you are allowed to cook. You are allowed to do certain things in certain circumstances. But when are you allowed to do that? If you prepare before Yom Tov, then you're able to you know, cook on Yom Tov. You, you can't start a fire, you know, you can't, but if you have the fire, there's certain things that you're allowed to do in certain circumstances, but if you prepare beforehand. So what's going to happen when Mashiach comes is that situation of Yom Tov. What it means is that we're not going to have that much free will when Mashiach comes. So what is the purpose of Mashiach comes? The things that you are working on before Mashiach comes, you have the ability to fulfill and complete when Mashiach comes. But if you aren't working on anything, if you aren't doing Shuvah on anything, then you don't have any option. You don't have any ability to go and work on it when Mashiach comes. And that's why people are very nervous when they're going and let's say they're converting. And they want to convert fast because you know what the non-Jews, this is what the non-Jews tell you. They're like, I see Mashiach is coming. I need to convert now. I can't wait a year or two. I can't go through the process. But the answer is that once you start the process, once you're in it, then it's fine. If Mashiach comes, you're able to go and continue it. And the same thing is when you're going and you're doing tshuva. If you're waiting for when Mashiach comes to do tshuva, then the, it's gonna, the door is going to close. You're not going to be able to fully focus on it. But if you started it right now, if you work on it right now, then you'll be able to fully complete it, fully you know, complete it when, uh, you know, to, to a, a really completion, the level that you need to when Mashiach comes. And that's how we circle back to where we started off with. How do we beat Adam? The exile that we are in today, the exile of Adam and Ishmael. How do we go and how do we beat them? How do we get out of them? It's not about fighting them. 
That's not how you're going to beat them. You know how you beat them? You beat them by going and fixing yourself, building your defense. Don't worry about going offense against them. Fix your, they all say, you know what, never again after the Holocaust. That's not, how you, that's not how you go and make sure that the Holocaust is not going to happen again. Not by, by making sure that you have a strong IDF. Then making sure that you have a strong, powerful army that's going to be able to go and defeat anybody that comes <laughs> against you. That you have nuclear weapons. That's not what's going to prevent the Holocaust. You know what's going to prevent the Holocaust? Fixing yourself. Building your defenses. Your spiritual defenses versus your, your offense. And that's what we need to do today. Today our objective, our, our tafkid, our, our purpose here is to fix ourselves in doing tshuva. And when we go and we return to the tshuva, then we're going to go and we're going to see the you know, Mashiach that's, gonna, that's going to come. And the, 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 I don't know how many times I said we're going to finish off, but we're really going to finish off with this. That the Gemara says this, the Midrashim say this, that in the end of the days, the Jewish people are going to need to do tshuva. It says, what if they're not going to do tshuva? says the Gemara that they're going to give decrees as difficult as a Haman because they're going to do tshuva. Meaning that you're going to do tshuva anyway. Either you're going to play it with good cop or bad cop. You want a cigarette and a coffee while you confess or you want to do it under beating and under waterboarding. Right? We're not talking about New York, America. Right? Uh, or America but not you know, what they say America does. So you can either do it, there, this, the, you're going to go and pack. Either you're going to do it the bad way, the difficult way, or you're going to do it the easy way. So it is incumbent upon each and every single one of us that when you leave this class tonight, think about it. At least one thing, what are you going to do that's going to change? What are you going to do and say, listen God, I see that I have a power of Avraham inside of me. I see that I have the ability to go and return to come to closer to you. And I see that there's Baal Shuvah that are coming so close, I'm going to utilize that. But what am I going to do? I'm going to pray a little better. I'm going to... I don't know, learn more. I'm going to dress more modest. Whatever it is that you feel you need to work on, you do. Now we'll open up for questions. Yes? So I heard um, a few times from my friend Jack who said something about like that 80% of the generation will not make it for the Tiyan 10. So what do we do with that? That's an excellent question. It says that uh, the when, when the, uh, the Jewish people left the Egypt, only a chomesh, a, a fifth. A fifth is 20% left, meaning that 80% did not go and leave uh, Egypt, meaning that 80% did not make it. Um, and uh, there are a lot of opinions that say this is what's going to happen when Mashiach comes. When Mashiach comes, 80% of the Jewish people are not going to make it, only 20%. And the answer is it doesn't have to be that way. It could be that way, but it doesn't have to be that way. The same way that you're dealing with the difficulties that the Gog and Magog, the war before Mashiach comes, it doesn't have to be difficult. There's two ways that it could happen. Either the entire Jewish people will go and follow to the Torah. And one of the ways that we know is actually keeping Shabbat. Shabbat, right, it says when we keep Shabbat and Mashiach, you know, the entire Jewish nation keeps Shabbat and Mashiach comes. But, but the, the other way is that if you don't listen, then yeah, it's going to be problematic. And it's possible that, um, you know, not everybody's going to make it. And that's why, you know, I, sometimes I speak to people that are secular and they lost a loved one. And they say, are they praying for Mashiach? And I'm like, what makes you think? I really should not speak to some people. I know that I shouldn't. I know that I shouldn't say what I say, but I say, what makes you think you're going to make it? Like, what makes you think? Like, I've had people tell me, yeah, he passed away, but he's in a good place now. I said, why? How do you, what makes you think that? Did he keep Shabbat? No. Kosher? No. Like, what makes you think that, that you know, he did? You know, and I, I spoke to a family recently that they lost a loved one a while ago. And I said, what makes you think that he's in a right pl good place? Again, maybe this is not the best thing. I, I don't know, whatever. This is my you know, method. Um, you know, better wake up now than, than later. And be like, what makes you think that he's in a good place? Like, because well, oh, he gave charity? That, that's great. I'm sure he's, he's going to get rewarded for that. But he didn't keep Shabbat. He didn't listen to anything God said. So like, no, you, you know, like, you, you know, the Torah works a certain way. Again, I'm not judging him or her. And I don't know. I, and I hope that, you know, that it goes to the best way. But don't utilize this concept to, con to, you know, to, to comfort you to saying, yeah, he's a good place. No, you have the ability now to do something for him. You want to make him in a good place? Start keeping Shabbat for him. That's going to make him in a good place. Don't just be like, yeah, it's a good place. What's on HBO? You know, like, let's see what's, you know, uh, I don't know what, Netflix, whatever it is. You know, like, let's see what else, and then you wait, uh, keep Shabbat, no, we'll go, part, go shopping. Uh, but no way, yeah, he's in it, we lit, we lit a candle for him. Yeah, it's very nice. You know, like, that's great, that's very important that he lit a candle for him. But, you know, it's very important that he said Kaddish for him. But what about doing something else? What about keeping Shabbat, keeping kosher? Like, you know, there's so many people that, uh, you know, again, should I say it, should I not? I don't know, it's a good question. I, I ask myself every time. After I say it, you know, beforehand, I suffer from word vomit. Words come out, and then I'd be like, hmm, should I have said that or not? Uh, but generally, people surprisingly take it really well. Like, we're ordinarily, I would expect someone to punch me in the face. They're like, okay, so maybe I should keep Shabbat. 
But like, well, yeah, that actually worked. I'm like, oh, oh my God, that's great. Yeah, like, let's do it. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and it's something that's very, very important. People need to hear the truth. If you go and be like, yeah, don't worry about it. Every Jew is going to be in the next world in the highest place. Be like, that's nice. And I would really, there was not, nothing else more that I would just want everybody to be in the highest place. But let's be realistic. Like, you have to be, you know, realistic of where you're holding in your life. And if you're not in a good place spiritually, then don't expect to be in a good place in the next world. I, I, it's, it's very unfortunate. Again, God is going to be very merciful. And God is going to, again, I'm not judging. Let's just be real. The Torah says that you have to do this. So do it. Once you do it, then you're a good person. Then you're going to be in a good place. If you don't do it, then at least one thing you have to do. Realize that you're doing something bad. If you realize you're doing something bad, then you have the ability to, to eventually do something good. So um, the, the, you're supposed to have your knees covered, right, when you're, when, you're, when you're wearing a skirt. But let's say somebody does not have their knees covered when they're wearing a skirt. Now again, whether you do it or not, just realize one thing, you're doing something wrong. Because if you think, well, no, it's really okay, it's not really, then you're never going to change. You have to realize that you're doing something wrong. And let's say there's a guy, I can't speak only about women. Let's say there's a guy that's, um, I don't know, not watching his eyes or you know, not learning to out the, the amount that he's supposed to. You're not doing it, then, then whatever it is, that's your prerogative. But the main thing is at least realize you're doing something wrong. Because if you realize you're doing something wrong, then you have the ability to go and eventually do something right. But if you think that what you're doing is okay, that your life that you're living in right now is fine, I'm good, me and God are tight, we're close, God knows me, I don't have to do this, God doesn't care if I keep Shabbat, God doesn't care if I keep kosher, God doesn't care if I'm modest, God doesn't care if I, keep, if I, if I learn Torah, then you're in a very, very bad place. Because then you're never going to change. So when you're coming to people and it says like, yeah, what happens before Mashiach comes, I tell them, and I, I still do plan on saying it, like, yeah, what makes you think you're going to make it? What makes you think I'm going to make it? You know, I have to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. You have to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Don't ever feel so confident about yourself that you're going to make it. We always have to keep on working ourselves and better ourselves. This is the obligation of what we hear in this world. And by the way, this is not only in the religious aspects. This is also in the aspects between relationships, character traits. You're an angry person. You're a lazy person. You're a jealous person. These are things that you have to work on. People don't usually put this in together. One of the series that I want to do, God willing, in the future is character traits. Like, how do you, you know, like, people don't even put it into their mind thought, like, wait a minute, if I'm lazy, I'm not supposed to be lazy. If I'm jealous, jealousy is a very bad thing. Jealous people cannot be happy. There's so many things that you have to focus on, and it's not only about what you read, in the, you know, like, like, you know, the, the obligation to keep Shabbat, keep kosher, keep that. There's so many other things. So we're looking at every single one of us, and let's say we're religious. Let's say we keep the Torah, but... How are our character traits? Are we good people? Do we do chesed? Do we go and, you know, do we, are we happy for people when they're successful? Are we jealous? You know, are we angry? Are, you know, there's so many different aspects of what we, are we humble? There's so many different things that we have to focus on. So if there's one thing that you take from today, is take something that you could change upon yourself. Take something that you could do and show God, listen, I know I have, I'm going to do my job. Any other questions? I don't know how we got to that. That was like not even a related to your question, but yeah. <laughs> then we'll get into a whole class in itself. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. That has nothing to do with That's fine. That's a question also. Is, does Hindu come from Ishmael or Esau? So Hinduism actually comes before Ishmael and Esau. Hinduism comes <laughs> before, um, it's part of you know, where the pagan you know, ideologies came, come from. But now what's happening is very interesting. You have Hindu people, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's Hindu people, where Islam is coming over over there and they're converting sort of to, into Islam. It might not be because they want to or they're forced to, but they're sort of like taking over you know, that region. And you have also the Christianity that's coming in. But Hinduism, it's in its own realm. It's, it's, it's paganism. It's Avodah Zarah. It's an ancient, ancient Avodah Zarah. Yeah, I wouldn't associate it with, with either or. It's like, it's like really, they, they have, I mean, if you know anything about Hinduism, they don't worship one idol. They worship like a thousand different idols. There's an idol for this, an idol for that, they, they, you know, and it's all shaped in different sizes, humans, animals, mix of bodies that they put, and they go and they, and they worship these, and you should never be, and you're not allowed to go into these temples, but they have different idols in different sections of their temple. And if you want, let's say, money, you focus on this idol. And then people go and they, they worship different things. They go around. They, they don't, you know, like it's like, it's like imagine you're going and you make a great Shmona Esle. And then you realize, okay, now you have to do it again for somebody else. You know, like for a different guy. Like, you know how, you know, tiring that is? Uh, you know, like after like one good davening, you're like, okay, fine. Like I'm good now for a few hours or, you know, to the next day. You know, which is terrible to say in the least. But, in the, you know, when you think about it, like Hinduism, if you want money, then you focus, cry out money. They do, right, they do, but they also, you know, they, they, you know, so let's say you want money, you want relationship, you want love, you want, I don't know. Yeah, but we're focusing to one God, right, but we focus to one God, right.
But what's interesting is, is that the way that it works with, with, when you're dealing with one god versus many gods is once you're dealing, let's say you have a good, um, I don't want to call it a catalyst, but like you start off like a good davening and let's say you could get like your emotions riled up and like, you know, sometimes where you're like, you like really connect to the prayer. And if you don't, you should try it because it's really good. Uh, it's really important. It's an obligation. So when you really connect to the prayer, then it's very easy to go from one thing to another. So you're connecting, even if you're crying, whatever it is, you're like crying to God, you're going from like, you know, finding a husband to panasa to children. You're going from one thing to another very fluidly. But imagine you're going and you're sitting in front of, you know, you know this, this idol and you're going and you're praying and then you finish with it. Then you go to the next idol and be like, all right, and scene. And then you start again from the entire thing. It's like, you know, like you can't really utilize that. And again, this is like some like minor problem uh, out of the billions of problems they have with obviously dealing with you know idolatry but uh, um, that is something that, that you have to, we have to be thankful for you know Baal Hashem there's one God there's one creator that you speak everything to him you don't have to deal with a thousand different you know gods and powers and one, uh, who knows why not did I answer your question? Yeah. Uh, why I'm not even on topic of the questions yeah Say that one more time, you're slacking off? What does that mean? What do you mean by... Let's say you're growing... So, right. Oh, Ooh, I was going to answer a different question then. So I'm not, I'm not following your question. So what do you mean that you don't have time for... God? You mean you're so involved in the test that you can't really get out of that rut? That you can't really connect to God? Okay, so, if, so the question is like this. The question is, well, let's say you're in a very difficult situation and to each their own because some people have um, what is a test for one person is not a test for another person so let's say someone is in a very difficult situation <laughs> and they can't get out of it so how do they go and how do they connect to God how do they do tshuva in, you know in that aspect and there's something so amazing so fascinating that tshuva works with partial credit so sometimes people are not able to get out of the rut that they're getting into and sometimes, and again, only God knows this, God doesn't expect you to get out of that rut immediately. But what God does expect is take a step in the right direction. So let's say somebody has a very, very difficult time. Uh, let's pick a sin. Uh, eating non-kosher. Very difficult time. So, and they can't. They just can't stop. So maybe instead of eating three meals non-kosher, they eat one meal kosher and two meals, and again, you, can never, you can't tell somebody, go eat two meals, not kosher, and one meal kosher. But I'm saying, like, they're, they're slowly, they're in the right direction. So what they need to do is take a step in the right direction. And that step usually starts off small, but the, very, the most important part is, is that you don't stop at that step. You take a step, and then you wait like two weeks. And then you take another small step. And then another small step. And slowly, slowly, when you increase the steps, you'll get to where you need to get to, and you'll have the connection that you need to. People think that, okay, I, I can't stop this, you know, immediately, so what's the point? Like, it's never going to happen. Um, uh, whatever, I'm going to say this anyway. I don't know if I could say this on camera. I was speaking to a person who has very, pro a very uh, is a guy who has a very strong problem with relationships. Um, not one, many, you know, relationships. Um, <laughs> at the same time. Um, I don't know how much more I have to go into. But, um, and I told him, you know, he says, it's impossible. I can't, I can't stop. So I said, can you stop one? Can you stop three? You know, I don't want to get to the numbers. <laughs> that was really sad. Um, and, um, and he says, yeah, I guess I... So, like, take a step in the right direction. Again, what you're doing is wrong, and it's bad, and you shouldn't do it, but take a step in the right direction, and slowly, slowly improve yourself. Now, again, this situation, and the reason why I was thinking about saying this is not because of, of the sensitivity of the matter, but rather the, the importance of the matter, because what... You know, this person is going. He went through. What well, I don't want to get into the details of what this person had, you know, went through in his life and, and why he's going through now, but there are some times where you're not able to physically